the effect of good international economics? Thank you, Mr. President. Well, th those are uh, excellent questions. Uh, on, the, on the first question, uh, your American counterparts will tell you I'm terrible with those little catchphrases and sound bites. Uh, so I haven't come up with anything catchy yet, but if you have any suggestions, let me know. <laughs> I'll be happy to use them. Uh, in, in terms of uh, local politics, uh, look, I'm the President of the United States. Uh, I'm, I'm not the President of China. I'm not the President of uh, Japan. I'm not the President of, of uh, uh, the other participants here. And so I have a direct responsibility to my constituents uh, to make their lives better. That's, that's why they put me in there. Uh, that accounts for some of the questions here about how concretely does me being here help them find a job, pay for their home, send their kids to college, uh, live uh, what we call the American dream. And I will be judged by my effectiveness in uh, meeting uh, their needs and concerns. But in an era of uh, integration, and interdependence. It is also my responsibility to, uh, to lead America into recognizing that its interests, its fate is tied up with the larger world. That if we neglect or abandon uh, those who are suffering in poverty, uh, that not only are we depriving ourselves of potential opportunities for markets and economic growth, uh, but ultimately that despair may turn to violence that turns on us. Uh, that uh, unless we are concerned about the education of all children and not just our children, uh, not only may we be depriving ourselves of the next great scientist who's going to find the next new energy source that saves the planet, uh, but uh, we also may uh, make people around the world much more vulnerable to anti-American propaganda. So, so if I'm effective uh, as, as America's president right now, part of that effectiveness involves uh, holding a providing uh, Americans insight into how their self-interest is tied up with yours. Uh, and, uh, and that's an ongoing project because it's not always obvious. And, and there are going to be times where short-term interests are going to differ. There's no doubt about it. And protectionism is the classic example. You can make arguments that if you can get away with protecting your markets as long as the other folks don't protect theirs, then uh, in the short term, uh, you may benefit. Uh, and, you know, it, it then it becomes uh, important not only for me to try to uh, give people a sense of why over the long term that's counterproductive, but also it becomes important for me to put policies in place in the United States that provide a cushion, provide support for those people who may suffer local dislocations because of globalization. Uh, and, and that's something that I think uh, every government has to think about. There are individuals who will be harmed by a trade deal. There are businesses who will go out of business because of uh, free trade. And to the extent that a government is not there to help them reshape their company or retrain uh, for the new jobs that are, uh, that are being created, uh, over time you're going to get people who see, who, who rightly see their personal self-interest in very narrow terms. This is the hand-hand, 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 hand-hand,
that was a little warm up. Uh, it is actually 90 minutes long. So if any one of you would like to have a copy of the other world leaders, some, most interesting sound bites on China, come to me. It'll be arranged. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on China. Uh, we call it China Chat because there are too many conversations about China at the moment going on. And uh, um, to call it debate uh, is probably uh, not the most relevant term. And I first came to Davos in 2001. Uh, when I was about five years old, and uh, <laughs> I, was, I came here as a, as a so-called global leader for tomorrow. China was a global leader for tomorrow back then, in 2001. And today, China is a young global leader. If you consider the new prosperous China born in 1978, and uh, to put it in the most fashionable way, China is like a 16-year-old Yao Ming, uh, which is already two meter tall, but still very young and uh, in his mid-teens and uh, still going through a lot of growing pains. And while, being, while interacting with the world, there's a lot of attention, a lot of discussion. And I've also come to realize that uh, there's a different sentiment about China this time in 2010 compared to 2009. Last year, when Premier Wen Jiabao was here, everyone was so nice to China because the world needs China. China is the last ray of hope for a world deeply trenched in crisis. Uh, but in this year, these days, the crisis is basically over, at least that's the consensus of most of the participants. And the world does not need China as much as it used to in 2009. So people start to question China. People start to be nervous about China. And are all these questions raised, and you've heard the Vice Premier defending China's policies yesterday. Um, and I feel compelled to contribute um, together with my fellow panelists and all of you here to a really good China session. Davos needs a really good China session. And if you go around Davos, you realize most of the magazines, newspapers, booklets here at the conference center, all the hotels are all US or European. So it's pretty obvious who controls information here in Davos. And it is the first time that CCTV's business channel is having its own televised discussion, which also happened to be part of the official program in Davos. It's long overdue, but I do have a lot of expectations. Uh, a quick introduction about the panelists I have here. Professor Li Daokui is a, uh, one of the most frequent commentators on CCTV's business channel, a brilliant economist. Um, Schwarzman, Steve, is the CEO of uh, uh, Blackstone, in which CIC, China's Sovereign Wealth Fund, invested. And uh, the CEO of China's largest private equity fund, Honey Capital, Zhang Zhao, and Klaus Kleinfeld, the CEO of Alcoa. Uh, the overall theme of this discussion is, in our own words, managing the global implications of China's growth, or rise, if you will. And uh, hopefully, we'll divide the discussion into three parts. The first part, the sub-theme is, will China spend more? I know that is a question weighing on the minds and hearts of many people here. And the second part of the discussion is a question called, does size equal responsibility? And thirdly, uh, we will be addressing the theme called going green, China going green, with or without you. So why don't we start with the uh, First subject matter, will China spend more? And I'd like to throw this question straight to Professor Li. Well, in my mind, there's no choice. There's no alternative. China will have to. China indeed has already been spending. Last year, 2009 is a you know, good example. In 2009, our export shrank by almost 20%. What did we do? We spent. The difference is that in 2009, we were using government budget to spend. Hopefully, uh, ideally, in the near future, we'll be able to switch to expenditure by households and by private and autonomous investors. So in my mind, no, the answer is clear. We have to spend because the world, our friends, are not willing to buy our products in the US, in Europe, right? They are unwilling. They are waging various kinds of measures against Chinese goods. Yeah, yesterday I heard from the Prime Minister of uh, Canada, 14 of the, out, out of the 20 uh, G20 countries, 14 governments already raised 
one way or the other, protectionist measures against uh, each other. I don't think China is one of them, right? So no choice, we'll have to spend. The issue is where, how, and when. Good question, you just did that on my behalf. The question is, in the absence of a really sound social safety net, can China, can China's grassroots level consumers spend more? In China, there are, we still have three top difficulties. One of them is, it's really difficult to get into college. It's really difficult to go to, to, go to the hospital. We don't really have a, a sound, comprehensive uh, healthcare system. And it's also very difficult to find a job. So uh, in the absence of such a sound social safety net, can China achieve that goal in the foreseeable future? Well, I really think so. Uh, I really think there are this is possible because if you analyze the fundamental reasons behind our relatively low share of household consumption in our GDP, the number one factor is the low increase, relative low space, low pace of increase of our disposable income. Our disposable income used to be 80% of our GDP. 25 years ago. Today, it is about 55% of GDP. So in the short run, uh, my observation uh, tells me that in the short run, the government has been pushing up various measures to, in to increase the share of household income in GDP by various kind of subsidies or tax reduction. So it is doable. Also, in the interim period, it makes sense for the government to subsidize various kinds of investments. These investments hopefully will be greener than existing production capital, right? Therefore, in the process of making these investments, not only uh, is China by buying more domestic goods rather than relying on, on exports, at the same time, China is greening up its production capacity. Steve, um, it is interesting that both the Chinese president, uh, Premier Hu Jintao, uh, during the Pittsburgh G20 summit, uh, he, he was trying to give global imbalance a different meaning. Besides the imbalance between China and US, trade and consumption, savings, there is also a greater imbalance between uh, the developed world and the emerging market economies and the least developed countries. That seems to be a bigger global imbalance. Uh, but when it comes to the accusation that China is not spending more and contributing to the global imbalance, do you think it is fair to China to take that blame? Well, I, I think there are a number of things that, that, that you said that maybe are worthy of a, uh, of a good dialogue. Uh, first, I, I think the world's absolutely focused on China as much in 2010 as it was in 2009. Uh, the, uh, Western economies are relatively weak, certainly compared to China. Uh, most economists look at Europe in 2010 as a one to one and a half percent growth. Uh, U.S. probably around uh, three percent. Uh, and to stimulate uh, and finance uh, the, the the deficits uh, uh, around the world, uh, the biggest. Uh, uh, buyer of that debt is China. And for China to take that role, uh, and it, it, it has to continue to grow. Uh, and where it consumes product around the world, uh, commodity product, uh, that those countries are experiencing much greater than average uh, GDP. So in a way, uh, uh, China is uh, uh, is, is, is the horses that, that, are, that are pulling the wagon. Uh, and I think that, that it's, it's a core part uh, of uh, global expectations uh, in, in markets and in finance. Now, uh, like most evolutions um, of, of export-led uh, uh, countries, uh, at a certain point, it grows a sufficient amount of wealth internally. Uh, some people call it uh, a middle class. Uh, depends what the name is. Uh, but you have to somewhat switch uh, your, your, your economy uh, to, to a domestic economy more, uh, like the previous speaker was saying, than, than just depending uh, upon exports. Now, I don't know that I accept uh, the concept that uh, was mentioned that the rest of the world, you know, is somehow shut uh, China off. Uh, really, uh, the rest of the world just simply doesn't have the money uh, to buy 
the Chinese goods. It, it, there, there's not, uh, you know, le leave aside some very minor uh, uh, trade friction. It's really quite low uh, considering the high unemployment uh, in, 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 in the West. Uh, you, you would expect way more uh, uh, trade friction. And I think uh, it's, it's a measure of the maturity uh, of, of the global system that people are, are quite open uh, uh, to the Chinese. So I, I don't think there's a need for over focus on that. Uh, the real issue is when, when you have consumers, for example, in the United States having 30% more debt than they have had historically, they're in a savings and debt pay down mode. Uh, and you can't be spending at the same time you're saving the same money. Uh, and so there'll be slower demand coming out of the West. And so I think uh, an expected outcome uh, for, for China is they will have to fill that, that lesser demand uh, with, with a variety of mechanisms to stimulate their own economy uh, and, and increase consumption, uh, which I think most people around the rest of the world think uh, because it has to happen, uh, it will happen. Now, the friction that goes along with that, uh, China's a complex place, uh, and the kind of factors that you mentioned in terms of health care and other things make uh, Chinese into super savers uh, on the world stage. You know, just, they save for their old age, they save for health, uh, and how you break that cycle, both psychologically and economically seems to me to be, you know, where, where this battle will be fought out. Thank you, Steve. Uh, John, uh, one of the, the quotes of uh, Vice Premier Lee yesterday, which failed to show up in, in this morning's uh, mostly financial newspapers, is to create an even bigger pie. And my take on this, the rationale behind this, this quote is that um, the world seems to be a little bit nervous about China grabbing a line share, or one of the bigger shares of this pie, while failing to see that if the world continue working with China in creating an even bigger pie, everybody will be better off. And, and there seems to be this um, conception or misconception that uh, China or countries such as China got most of the benefits of globalization for the past 30 years, as if the U.S. consumers did not enjoy the benefits of low-cost made in China products. What's your take on this? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I think there is a common feeling, uh, it's not scientifically researched now, it's a feeling that emerging markets like China's rapid growth, including in a global financial crisis, we seem to have less pain, is at the cost of developed world. So developing world's gain is develop world loss. So I think in that context, <clears throat> Mr. Li Keqiang really reminded everybody there's other way to think about this, that is our more efficient world, globalization, um, may create uh, on a global basis per unit input, more output for everyone to share. Uh, but uh, along that vision, we needed to overcome short-term pain, the fact that uh, there are places where job loss is more severe, and there are places where because some um, local characteristics, like China or other developing world, was way, way poor just 10 years ago, they have a you know, very low base, so their speed of coming up is faster. These local phenomena just need to be um, sourced through. Uh, so I think that comments from Mr. Li is uh, very timely to, to sort of highlight the fact that uh, together we can pro pr probably create more uh, and to allocate uh, so everybody is happier versus you know, the emerging world's happiness is at the cost of a developed world. Mm. And Klaus, would you concur? That well, I'd concur to many things, and maybe I just add on to some of those points uh, to, to your earlier question. I mean, to me, I mean, I'm hearing also other voices about China uh, than the ones that you might be referring to coming more from the political field. I mean, what I'm hearing more from the business world, and I would be more in that camp, is that I give the highest marks possible to the Chinese uh, administration for having responded so quickly and so smartly, uh, and basically having achieved this growth last year and stayed 
stabilized the economy and driven it further and pulled a lot of other places, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, further along with them. At the same time, on the, the, the aspect of more consumption, I almost think it's inevident to, that, that that's going to happen. It's not, in my view, imposed by the West on China. I think it's more along the fundamental principle, what I understand is, is the, the main concern that's going on in China, how do you develop a harmonious society? That by itself is a gigantic task if you have 1.3 billion people, right, distributed over a vast landscape, right, and not just on the, on the coastal front, with urbanization and rural problems, big time rural problems. So I think most of us can't, can't even conceptualize that and will only grasp it when you visit, and not only visit Shanghai, but visit some other, some other reasons and see the differences. I believe when you just look at the statistics, you just look at what do people want, human beings want, whether they are Chinese, they are Indian, or whether they live in the Amazon, you know, they, they want to have enjoy the freedom of liberating themselves from some barriers. I mean, we see in the Amazon, they buy a motorcycle, right? They go from walking to bicycle to motorcycle, then to car. It's exactly the same thing that you see in China happening, right? Now even accelerated with the stimulus program last year. But if you look at the absolute number of cars just as a, as a proxy for this, four cars for every 100 inhabitants, right? If you look at, I think the European average is 60, in the US you have 80, right? And in spite of that, it was last year where China has been producing and selling more cars than any other country on this planet, right? Just imagine what potential is in there. However, this potential will only come out, to your point, if the social network will grow along with that. My, I was impressed that in the, in the stimulus program, a lot of those aspects have been taken care of. And when Premier Wang was here in Davos, and in, in, in we had a, a private session with him, and he was very, very clear that this is a fundamental aspect of how to change the society to a, a more normal society along the line of harmonious society. Basically playing with the needs and desires of people. And the same thing holds true if you look at refrigerators, if you look at air condition. All of that has been happening, but we're only seeing the beginning of it. Mm. And if I can go back to my earlier analogy of China as a 16 or 14 year old Yao Ming, the basketball player, the size is already there. If you look at the statistics, everything is pointing to the same conclusion that China is already a significant global power. Uh, as you said, the number one uh, sales in terms of sales and production car company, a car uh, country in the world, and uh, most likely second largest economy in the world, replacing Japan, number one export in the world, replacing Germany a few years ago, and four out of the f top five financial institutions are now Chinese, those state-owned enterprises. So, um, However, there seems to be uh, a distance between the expectation of the world on China and China's reality, uh, exactly demonstrated by uh, what happened in the last year. There are all these uh, talks of the so-called G2 that I personally am strongly against, um, country of two, the Chimerica, blah, 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 all these exaggeration of China's rise as a global power side by side uh, with the United States. Um, I, I think most of the sentiment here in Davos was that in year 2009, the United States failed to provide that kind of leadership that President Obama mentioned in that press conference in London. Uh, and in the absence of that, automatically the world was looking at China to provide that kind of leadership. But China is not there yet. So how should we manage that expectation? You don't you disagree no, with I, me? I would, I would not agree with that view, honestly, because I think, uh, and I would also give the U.S. administration and the crisis, including the, the world administrations and the crisis, super high marks. I mean, this was very, very close to going totally bust. And, and when you see how they have managed through it and how quickly they've taken decisions, my impression is your, your image, the image that you had with a 16-year-old one being super tall, you know, I think is great. It's a great analogy. And in a way, some of the things that you are saying, I think, are more happening in some of the perceptions in China mm. and, 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 and are overblown and sometimes also increased by 
uh, comments by people that really haven't done the good study on China. Professor Lee. Well, I think that let's continue using the metaphor of Yao Ming, right? 16 years old, uh, two meters high. The height is there, however, the muscle isn't there, the, right? The skills, the capacity isn't there. And moreover, the, uh, the, the reading ability of the rules of the game isn't there. Maybe we we'll only understand the written rules. We don't understand the unwritten rules, the implicit rules, right? So therefore, the expectation of China playing a leadership, leadership role in the world affairs is very much misplaced. Never before in history, and I argue, never will be in history in the future, right? Well, can we, are we going to observe a country as poor uh, as um, 3,000 or 4,000 US dollars per capita playing the role of a leader? China does not, doesn't have uh, any single aircraft carrier. We don't have overseas military base, right? We, we don't have this. We don't, have, we, don't, we don't understand. Moreover, we are very, very concerned. We are very busy dealing with domestic issues, many, many domestic issues, just like Klaus, you just uh, eloquently mentioned, right? So we, our energy is so much occupied in solving our own issues, and arguably, solving properly our own issues is our biggest contribution to the humankind right now. So should I say, Professor Lee, that what you said is basically that the, the conclusion that I drew that size does not equal responsibility, that right. the world once again is entering a period um, of, of uh, overvaluing China. That's true. That's definitely the case, yeah. Well, I think yes and no. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the world doesn't understand be, uh, China's real situation because China has highly concentrated institutions. So when you say, was, was it four of the five largest banks? You basically have five banks. Uh, and you have, you know, like a lot of people, and so the banks are big. Uh, and people equate that with uh, economic uh, 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 strength. Uh, you, you, China has uh, enormous uh, uh, reserves, uh, and so people equate that with strength. Uh, most people in the West, I can assure you, have absolutely no idea that China's per capita income is about number 100 in the world. And if instead of positioning the country as if it is indeed a wealthy, powerful country, which is the perception in the press, and it's the perception certainly in the West, if you basically said, uh, we are the 100th poorest, poorest country in the world, you wouldn't have quite so much focus on you, right? Uh, and and I, I think that, that what goes with the focus and, and with the number of people uh, is a certain amount of responsibility that comes through the concentration in these large institutions that, that China has, as well as the fact that it actually has a superior decision-making mechanism to address complex problems. Um, democracy is a wonderful thing. Uh, I was raised in democracy, and I believe in it. Uh, uh, completely. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Now but, I know why CIC invested in you. <laughs> but I, I, I must tell you, it is a complicated uh, 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 structural way to deal with complex problems in a hurry. And you're watching that now get played out uh, in terms of, of financial reform and health care reform and other uh, types of things. And one reason why, why the West looks at China and, and perhaps overvalues uh, uh, its uh, uh, ability to be a global leader is, is simply the fact that it can make decisions when other parts of the world know what the problems are, but they can't quite get there in terms of making decisions. So in a way, the world wants to hand the baton off to China a bit and say, look, you know, we all sort of know what ought to happen. Why, why don't you guys just make it happen? Because you can. You can have a meeting of your senior leadership and you can take a position and it'll happen while everybody else is just sort of talking. Uh, and that's an element that I don't know that, that, 
people in China understand. Uh, and it's an important element. And, and when you say China is overvalued in terms of what it can do, remember that people watch China do amazing things. And so they just say, well, if they can do amazing things in one area, and they can do amazing things in two areas, and they can do amazing things in three areas, why don't they all help us out and do an amazing thing in something that would be useful globally? But if China is as efficient as you said, and uh, amazing as you mentioned, why, did, why didn't Blackstone invest in any company in China in 2009? Well, I think in terms of 2009, you had a whole uh, uh, world that was going through discontinuity. Uh, you know, if you remember, uh, I, I, I think I remember something about the Chinese stock market going down uh, last year somewhat. Uh, and all kinds of odd things were happening uh, everywhere uh, in the world. And uh, in a way, uh, many financial uh, people uh, were uh, somewhat cautious, uh, has nothing to do with China, uh, waiting to see uh, if, the, if the global system uh, was going to heal. Thank you, Steve. John, um, there are a lot of accusations in China, uh, on China now, that one of the buzzwords is, is China as a free rider of globalization. How would you react to that? Is that a fair accusation? Well, you know, I, I don't think it's a fair uh, accusation. Globalization didn't start with China. It started to by everybody um, after many years of development, you know, together we decided uh, that's the way to go. Uh, I think uh, the topic of this year's uh, the theme for this Davos is rethink, uh, redesign, rebuild is very fitting because a lot of, if anything that we've learned in this crisis uh, is uh, old way of thinking or old model um, really do not work. I, I, I've seen more predictions being wrong, more economists' theory being very wrong um, in such short concentration of time than any other time. Um, so we've decided to go global, and China started uh, echoing that requirement by opening up. Uh, the door actually was opened up by internal force reform and external force. Remember, you know, China was asked, uh, I would say forced, to join WTO. So the door is opened. Um, then China didn't have a lot to offer except cheap labor. So China started by uh, using cheap labor in exchange for, I remember at the time, some goods. Coca-Cola, the first bottle, uh, was super expensive. Some technology, equipment. Later on, China continued to um, use its market. China now we need to know is probably the world's number one sizable, fast-growing market, which is super attractive to everybody. Uh, GM probably made more profit in China uh, last year alone than anywhere on Earth. So we use market to get, but China really developed itself smartly, it, it, not like some of the uh, uh, other Development country early days, you just you know do low-level exchange. There was a requirement: you have to do a joint venture, you have to have a certain percentage of local ownership. If you want to make cars or airplanes in China, you have to have local components and roadmap to be totally local. Which I think you know Chinese government did exactly what Obama was trying to do for U.S. people. That is making its own people life better. So I think China didn't uh, really do this. I remember just you know one more point, and you're talking about unfair. If you are inside China, last year there was overwhelming sentiment by local Chinese entrepreneurs saying we were so we, we were really treated as a second-class citizen because if you are a foreign company doing business in China, you get tax break. If you are a local Chinese company starting Chinese company, normally you don't get the kind of same tax break. Last year, that got finally repealed. All businesses are taxed equally. So I, I, I think you know, it really depends on how you look at it. You know, I don't think it's uh, you know, simply say fair or unfair. I think mm -hmm. we all develop together. Professor Lee, where do you think those misconceptions of China being afraid of come from? And, and I know there are a lot of expectations on China to do many things in 2010. For instance, appreciating the Chinese currency, renminbi, again. And as someone who constantly advises China's top decision makers, what, what is your best guess? Uh, 
Well, I think my good friend uh, Steve's points are very, very interesting. I think highly, highly, it's very typical of these kind of expectations. He's, he argued very effectively, China has been doing amazing things in a number of areas. Why not do more? Why not extend our uh, uh, skills or capacity to other issues? I would argue that China has been doing things very effectively on these few things just because we have been, uh, China has been very, very focused in solving these issues. And these issues are most important, not only for China, but also for the whole world. For example, poverty relieving, for example, uh, solving social uh, problems and uh, solving uh, basic problems of economic growth. So if you ask China to extend its, uh, its, its capacity or extend its attention beyond these basic issues, I would argue that by definition, we're not going to be able to de deliver on the most important things. On these most important things, social issues, domestic economic growth, if we fail to maintain the current, current momentum of economic growth, of social development, I don't think we're doing a favor to the whole world. So I think that's very, very interesting points. You, do you have an answer for my question earlier? Sure, I think this is an this is a, this is a answer, right? Because mm -hmm. I think my good friend, uh, Mr. Schwartz, uh, points are very, very typical. What, what about the currency? The currency, okay, I see. I think the single most important economic variable, which is widely, widely misunderstood in the world is currency, is the exchange rate. Mm. People in the world argue that exchange rate matters. Exchange rate is the most important variable affecting uh, trade balance. Actually, it is not, right? Look at the experience of Japan. In the, in the Japanese case, the exchange rate suddenly appreciated by more than 100%. However, within 18 months, trade surplus came back to Japan and persisted for the past 20 years. The reason is that fundamentally, fundamentally, trade balance reflects differences in savings rate. Until the Americans, right, saves more. Until the Americans spend, uh, spend less, we cannot solve the problem of our trade key sure. balance with the, with the US and with other countries. So it has to be a joint, a joint effort between China and other countries to solve the problem. Meanwhile, I also emphasize the so-called global economic imbalance did not happen overnight. It happened over the past 20 or 10 years. So almost by definition, we cannot solve it overnight. We have to do it, we have to solve it, deal with it gradually. If we solve it overnight by suddenly appreciating our exchange rate, many, many unpleasant things would happen, which I don't think the Americans, the Europeans would appreciate. Mm. Klaus. Yeah, I, I, let me raise one other point why I believe the responsibility aspect is a critical one. Because in a way, it almost sounds to me as though there might be a Chinese assumption as though you can carve China off and live on your own happily, right? But as we all know, that's not the case. Even if we just forget about the consumer market in the US, right? That part I think you could solve. But there's a whole other element here, which is more in my camp, the whole natural resources. Right? And we have seen, and I've been a big proponent of that, of making Chinese companies more of a part of the global natural resources industry, which I believe is healthy. It's healthy to also lead to a better distribution of what you do and how you use your resources currently in China, right? The ones that you have least of, I see in our industry, the amount of energy that is so rare in, in China that goes into aluminum smelting doesn't make sense on a global scale. At the same time, I totally understand that you don't want to go away from having that in your own camp as long as you don't see that there is an open reception from the rest of the world. Now, guess what? The open reception from the rest of the world will only happen if the rest of the world understands there are some rules that this is all played by. And I'm personally totally convinced that you fully understand the rules, but that's not what counts. What counts is the perception. Right? So I would argue that part of it is also to become more integrated on that end plays into this responsibility discussion. It's almost like to go back to your analogy, I mean if you had that player and wanted to bring him onto your team, you would have to know that that person also is capable of passing on the ball right, to make the game win. Mm. And speaking of perception, perception really matters. 
And as I said, the information control here in Davos is completely controlled by Western media and also Western coverage. For instance, I also brought with me a book all the way from China. It is a Chinese version of a book called When China Rules the World. It was published in 2009. It quickly became a bestseller in the United States and in other parts of Europe. And now it is getting to be a bestseller in China because, of course, the mere title serves as a nice massage of the Chinese ego, <laughs> which we need to manage as well. So, John, how would you react to such books and coverage and newspapers? These, in my own opinion, help contribute to the, to the perception. Yeah, I would say that uh, it's uh, <laughs> the official word is uh, communication issue. I think the world is just learning about China. I really echo Steve's early point. Uh, people come to Shanghai when you visit China for the first time. You don't go to a village that is three hours from Shanghai, which would be similar to that of any poor uh, part of Earth you would ever see anywhere. Uh, so people get uh, a wrong impression when they see Olympic game, they thought this is how China does everything. China doesn't do everything that way. We do one game in 2,000 years that way. Um, and uh, I think uh, domestically, uh, Chinese people are just learning how to communicate well. Uh, I, I'm always a little bit worried that we uh, didn't have a lot of money. All of a sudden, we have some money we think we have the world's, you know, uh, wealth. Uh, the re clear example is uh, I'm an investor, so I, I spent a lot of times, uh, 15 years in Silicon Valley. I really witnessed and participated in venture capitalists, uh, creation technology, you know, the creation of internet in Silicon. Uh, and then I'm in China, I, my office is in Chinese version of Silicon Valley, it's called Zhongguancun, Zhongguang Village uh, in Beijing. I could easily see many people thinking that there are better inventors than Americans in Silicon Valley, which is absolutely true, not true. Uh, and uh, and uh, a clear example would be uh, a, a, there was a proposal that was sent to a very high level authority in China not long ago. It says, you know what, we're Chinese, we need to have our own you know, core, Silicon core. We should not rely on Intel's core anymore. The budget is two billion RMB and we'll start from scratch. No, oh, I run a silicon company in, uh, in Silicon uh, Valley some time ago. Two billion RMB would not get me to start on the application. Uh, so I think a, a lot of element in China are not experienced enough to realize um, a lot of these technology uh, wells that was created in West. It didn't take one day. And the kind of things that we have are just scratch of the surface. We've got a long way to go. So we needed to start to tune down and really, uh, really think through this and, and, and communicate with the world that we're just learning. We're just you know, making baby steps. So in other words, while the world needs to manage its, its expectations on China, Chinese people themselves, ourselves, yeah. needs to right. manage our own expectations of yeah. China's growth. In business, we, we always, I learned this in the US, by the way, that as a CEO, that is never listen to your own PR. <laughs> well, as a company, you always want to portray to the outsider that you are winning, you are winning, you're a winner, no matter how hard it is inside. But you can't listen to that and believe your own PR. Uh, Country has pride, right? Chinese people, after 2,000 years of more or less being suppressed, wanted to see, you know, some light. But again, you know, the reality is 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 more important. But I was curious if Steve and Klaus have experienced in China, if you have any experience in China that you felt uncomfortable that Chinese counterparts or um, friends or or business partners were being arrogant or because of of China's growth, or in other words, um, it gives you a sense or feeling that this is, in the words of Financial Times, a Wall Street Journal, my house, my toys, my rules. Well, I, I think you get that in every country. Uh, <laughs> there, there's nothing unique uh, about China in, in that regard. Uh, people are proud of what they do, uh, and uh, they probably should be. They've achieved a lot. That's a good thing. Anybody who's not Chinese is, is, is playing by someone else's rules and on somebody else's um, uh, uh, turf. So, so you, you always expect uh, 
no matter where we operate in the world, for people to be uh, proud of what they do and somewhat self-confident. Uh, I, I don't think we find uh, uh, people we deal with in, in China to be in any way belligerently that, that, that way. Uh, you know, they're smart, they want to learn. Uh, if you have something to, to teach, they are, they are just all over you. Um, uh, they're they're, they're, they're uh, very flexible. Chinese are very flexible as a, as a culture, and they're extremely high energy. Uh, and that's the makings of a, of a dynamic um, um, economy, a dynamic culture. Uh, it's like everybody's learning at the same time. And, and, and yes, your first encounter might be, we sort of know what we're doing, but as soon as you point out uh, that maybe there's another way to do it, they go, ah, yes, okay, let's do that. Uh, Thank you. There Thank are many you. countries in the world we need where more when you point like that you. out. We need more people like you on Capitol Hill. <laughs> well, there's a reason I'm, I'm not on Capitol Hill. I mean, here I, mean, he, here I am, uh, you know, so they might not appreciate me. Uh, if I might add to that, I think there's one, one difference to that, and which is I consider a very positive difference. There is kind of a historic memory. And uh, I mean, a handshake is a handshake that I've seen. And uh, I've also seen that uh, people do remember and it builds. You build trust over time, which happens in every business relationship. But here, I've seen more that it gets passed on, right? And that once you have built a certain reputation, you come as a friend. Right, and that I find is a very, very nice thing. And if I add another thing, I, I've been impressed with the quality of people, particularly as I've seen very often that there is a combination of a technical degree with a business or a social degree, and that brings out a much broader personality. Mm. And it, so it's not true that, as those articles have said, that business gets to be done in China quietly in, in, through a boardroom backroom diplomacy. I don't see that as a contradiction, and, but right. I would, I would uh, go along with, with Steve there. I mean, you have situations where you do things in a boardroom quietly, I mean, in every uh, transaction, and there's others when you have to bring more people in, so I would not consider that to be any specific. Well, as a scholar, I really have a serious quibble with the author of this book. If you are going to write a book with such a bold title, you better have to read some history, right? Yeah, In history, China never ruled the world. I don't think China will ever rule the world. Why? Because fundamentally, you have to understand the civilization of China. The civilization, civilization of China is rooted on Confucianism, and Confucianism uh, has been advocating people to seek peace with your own internally in your soul and to seek harmony in the society and to seek harmony with your neighbors. I don't think our civilization is suited for a country to become a ruler of the whole world. So it's a fatal, fatal mistake in this book. Nowadays, I don't understand. Sometimes books without mistakes don't make sale, right? You have to make mistakes <laughs> to make a good sale. That's true. China was never a global power. And in my own experience as a journalist, uh, I think China very often is very often the victim of uh, the desire to sensationalize stories in global journalism. For instance, I think another mistake the uh, Financial Times made recently uh, was actually two days ago, the first day of the, uh, the, the forum. Uh, there was on the front page headline news on, on Financial Times that China is about to give loans to the Greek government. But yesterday, the Greek prime minister denied that they've never had contact with Chinese and it was, this was never part of the conversation. Um, it, it, that's the reason why I, I found it very interesting why they had to move that story. Well, trust me, they do the same to us. If you want Steve to comment on that or me. <laughs> yes, I, I, mean, I, I find everything that's always written about us is completely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I one, one of the things uh, 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 that... Uh, China feels uh, at, exactly at, the at, same. At, at a, at a, <laughs> at a uh, one of the sessions yesterday, uh, Barney Frank, uh, who is a U.S. congressman, said to the group of people uh, who were in finance uh, was, you know, you ought to just grow up and get used to people attacking you because when you become successful, 
Uh, sometimes people don't like you and they write things about you. They invent things about you. They position you in a way that is inaccurate, that satisfies their needs. And I think one of the things uh, that happens to uh, China, because you know, if you look at it, I mean, China was the fastest growing major economy in the world. And people, you know, just sort of write things. The, the reality of the fact that that was achieved through massive economic stimulus somehow gets lost. And they'll write whatever it is. So, so if you're looking for fairness um, and balance, my experience is looking to the media to do that for you is the wrong place to look. <laughs> let's just say they're jealous of, uh, let's just say they're jealous of China's growth. But um, John. When, when you hear or read certain journalism or certain articles of, of those media talking about China with a certain sense of moral supremacy and self-righteousness, how would you react? What, what do you think? Well, I, I, I got hurt so many times where when I read things like this, I don't feel hurt anymore. I think, it's, uh, as Steve said, uh, you just take it uh, or deal with it. Um, but individual dealing with the one thing, national pride or nationalism comes in play as the different things. And sometimes these, these things get spin out of the way and they get used to extend other agenda. I, I, I want to say this in general. Uh, everybody, well, let's see what we agree, what we don't agree. We, we pretty much agree, uh, I mean, globally, that there's going to be a new order. Um, new global reality, politically, financially, economically. What we don't agree is the roadmap to that new order. Uh, so we can't even agree on what is the body that who will create a new order. Um, and uh, what is the, you know, writing principle. You think about this carbon um, um, thing that we're talking about. What's the, you know, principle, common differentiator? How do you implement it? So we're going to have a lot of problems we have to work through. But one thing that seems to be unstoppable is that uh, people in poor area of the world would want to better their, their life, just like more developed part. With the experiment we've done, we've done together, globalization in the last 20 years, that seems to be a fairly efficient way of getting there. At the same time, more developed area would have to start to realize that's coming and start to learn to accept that while the poorest part, while they gain power, like a Yaomi example, they need to get their software up to the snub as quickly so that they can carry the shared global responsibility. So I think that's very, very certain. And what is uncertain, which I predict in the next 20 years, we're gonna have a lot of friction in solving that, uh, is how to get there. And uh, which brings, out, uh, brings uh, out our third subject matter, which is in the post given Copenhagen world, uh, whether China will go green with the world or without. Uh, my personal experience at the Copenhagen summit was that it, it, very few people in the world really understood what really happened at Copenhagen because it, it is not an open forum. Nobody really knows what the discussion was like. So I was there with probably 3,000 journalists out there waiting for news and there was no news and it was like 2 o'clock a.m. in the morning local time. And then finally all of a sudden, White House released a piece of news on the probably New York Times website. And it was the first news release. So the entire world used that to be the ultimate outcome of the Copenhagen. And in that news release, China was blamed for not doing enough. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it's all about PR, and, 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 or if you zoom out, it's a matter of soft power. But having said that, I'd like to take the brains of the four gentlemen here about China's role. Well, in my mind, there are two kinds of countries in the world. The first kind of countries uh, speak a lot, talk a lot, while, while doing nothing or doing very little. Second kind of countries are doing a lot while talking relatively little. In my mind, China doesn't belong to the first group of country, right? Mm. We are. China has been implementing various policies, serious policies to, in, to reduce the carbon intensity of the economy. In the past three years, the carbon intensity has been decreasing by roughly about three, four, or five percent a year. 
By my calculation, before long, within the coming 10 years, China's carbon intensity will be reduced to the same level as today's US economy, even though it's still a very poor economy. So in this regard, I think number one, the number one of role of China is to do, to do whatever we have been doing, lead by deeds, right, rather than lead by talking, right? Number two, China is entitled to coordinate with other poor economies like India and Brazil. This is not conspiracy, this is a coordination, right? Just like the Americans are coordinating with Europeans. There, everybody is entitled to a free world, it's free speech society. So better coordination, through coordination, we reach collaboration. So these are the two things I think China uh, needs, to be, to, to, needs to do, and China has already been doing. And China is doing that in spite of the fact that co companies like General Motors are still trying to sell more cars in China. And also, I think figures uh, speak for themselves as well. China has already contributed uh, 2 trillion RMB mm -hmm. onto, onto these efforts. And I think it's pro uh, China has also was among the first nations to come up with a, a specific number of carbon emission standards, 40 to 45 percent. John. I want to add something. You know, one thing that struck me very uh, hard yesterday out of uh, Mr. Li Keqiang's speech mm. or the private session um, was he mentioned actually uh, China's volunteer commitment to reduce carbon consumption, this and that, um, and he gave some very specific numbers, are not really necessary for showing to the world that China is a responsible country. It is, you know, we're, we're doing this for the sake of our own internal needs. You know, when we compare economy, we like to use comparisons. You know, China with all the car sales yes, last year, uh, you know, four cars per 100 people, right? Versus US, 80 cars per 100 people. Well, imagine China get to US level, 80 people, uh, 80 cars per, China, uh, per 100 Chinese people. Uh, Earth doesn't have enough energy to support, support that. So China actually, by looking at that, knew that the new development model, if, it, if that government wants to bring happiness and harmony to that 1.3 billion people, it's not going to be the US model of happiness. So out of motivations like that, I knew uh, that there was a lot of concern about you know, green energy, low carbon. You know, one thing, another example, uh, four years ago, when I went to uh, Sichuan province, you know, a let's say one, two, three, four level uh, county city, and all the taxi were you know, natural gas powered. So China actually has a lot of uh, things that was done to reduce pollution, reduce energy, or use new energy uh, before all these arguments started. So I, I, I think uh, those are the things to, to think about. It, so I, it's not because there's negotiation, there's this political fight. China started to dress up and talk about it wanted to be low carbon and, and energy uh, conserving. It actually has to do that if it wanted to develop. China made a, uh, a major decision several years ago on pollution and approaching the environment uh, to really address this and clean things up. And that's widely known in China, and it's barely known anywhere else in the world, okay? The rest of the world, people have a vision of China with, with you know, sort of giant-sized cities covered with pollution. That, that is the vision of China. Uh, and the fact that anybody is addressing that is almost utterly unknown. And the reason why you get pressure on that is that the, the, the Western countries believe that China can do remarkable things. And, and I'll give you one example so you'll understand the point. It's called the Olympics. Now, the Olympics, as put on by China was simply the most amazing thing that I've ever experienced by way of a live performance. The opening games, the opening, opening ceremonies were um, astonishing. They were unrivaled uh, by anything that I know has ever been produced as a live performance. They were perfectly executed. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people involved with precision. Now, 
when the world looks at China, it says, my goodness, if they can do something so astonishing, they, they certainly should be able to clean up cities and they look to China to be able uh, to do that. Now, you are already doing a lot and you ought to be able to market that. And, and to the extent, also one other thing about China that you don't understand, I don't think, is that on maps of the world, China takes up a lot. Mm. People think it's a big, powerful country, right or wrong. And there is a great opportunity to take what you do and position it on the world scale to be uh, very much of a leader in an area where, frankly, I think you're going to end up as a natural leader anyhow uh, Point in taken. the environment. Klaus, yeah. and then we'll I, open the floor. I, I must say, Copenhagen to me is a tragedy. And, and I'll tell you why. Because when uh, President uh, when came to, uh, who came to uh, the, the UN climate change, a summit, he actually talked about a whole program of what China is now doing. Right. Three weeks later, we saw it in our own industry, basically indicating no new permits for smelters, reduction of smelters that don't have a certain uh, technical standards, all happening in the next, next three years. So I was very optimistic. I mean, the U.S. with the new administration talking about climate change, China, the two players that we all needed, you know, to come together, they were there. They go to Copenhagen and something odd happens. I haven't figured out what happened, but I'm sure that the reports that we've received are not accurate. I hope so, that in, these, in spite of what you think about David, the G2 or not, you know, I think as a role model for the world, it doesn't work, I agree with you. But to get moving into the climate change, I think we desperately need some type of conversation between G2. Otherwise, this thing is going to go down a very, very bad path of misunderstandings of real misunderstandings, in my view. The tragedy of the tragedy at Copenhagen. The mask agenda. I, I agree, um, but there, uh, lot, it's a tragedy, in my view, a communication tragedy. The tragedy was, in my own humble opinion, mostly because of the sheer incompetence of the old UN system. It just, they just can't, you just can't think, get things done when there are too many people in the room. That's the reason why G20 will UN, become a UN system. UN system. That's why the G20 will become a much more platform to get but big decisions But before that, on. you need a G2 in this, in this particular area. OK, I'll, now I would like to open the floor. We don't have too much time left, but the same old rules, identify yourself, quick comments or questions. The gentleman in the second row. Yes, um, my name is Do we need a, a microphone? My name is Masaki Omura, uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Uh, my question uh, should be addressed to Professor Daokui. I mean, uh, I have uh, no disagreement uh, about uh, admitting uh, in China's contribution to the current world and uh, ability to continue momentum near future. But my question is, uh, uh, are you able to uh, keep same momentum in the medium term because of aging? Uh, comes from uh, one-child policy. And in the past, a uh, huge Chinese population uh, worked as an asset. But in, in, in medium term, maybe it worked as a liability, uh, taking into consideration a necessity of uh, safety net. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think aging is a major problem in China. It wouldn't be in the near future. Why? Simply because Chinese uh, per capita income is so low. By implication, there are many, many people in China who are willing to work when they are 60 years old, when they are 60 year, 65 years old. Today, we are forcing our 60-year-olds to retire, whereas they are willing to work. And their average health level is much better than their counterparts 20 years ago. So there is a great, great room for institutional innovation to solve the aging problem. So I'm, on this issue, I'm perfectly confident. And I think you might have drawn the conclusion that the best way to look at China is to, is, is to through the lens of per capita. Everything divided by 1.3 billion is tiny, or times by 1.3 billion will be phenomenal. Uh, I, I remember in Copenhagen when President Obama gave the speech, he said, US as a second largest emitter in the whole world, blah, 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 blah. And instantly the Chinese participants were felt a little bit uneasy because obviously in per capita terms, it's not the case. Second question, Mr. Xu. Uh, 
Uh, Taling Su, uh, Chairman of uh, HQ uh, Asia Pacific. Yesterday there was a session on similar subject, and uh, uh, Dr. Cheng Siwei, uh, Professor Cheng Siwei, said in the very beginning that this is an issue about mutual trust. This is an issue about the friendship. This is an issue about feeling about each other. I mean, we all know that if you have a, your best friend and the husband and wife has a quarrel or something, you don't go to their house and start uh, analyzing everything you know, the husband said, the wife says, and all that. You do is uh, you want to make sure that they, uh, they talk about their love, talk about their children, talk about their family, talk about the benefit, talk about the future. And then when the uh, good feeling is established, then all the other issues become non-issue. So I think uh, here I'm hearing a lot of this is a perception, a lot of this is just about the feelings about each other and f try to find something to argue. And the uh, important thing, I agree with Tseng Sui. I think uh, important for the Chinese and Americans and uh, the world to establish a, a, a good uh, mutual trust. Last question. Uh, Adrian Chihok from, from the Keio University in, in, in Tokyo. Um, uh, when China went from the more, let's say, socialist system to market system, I think one thing was lost was uh, people lost the kind of basic health care, because I think in this more socialist system, everyone had a kind of a universal coverage. So uh, what's the Chinese government going to do to address this issue? I think this leads to very basic insecurity in most Chinese people's lives that they have to uh, worry about saving money for their health or if they go to hospital. Is, it, is this going to be addressed? Will universal health care again come back to China? I, I, I would try this uh, in the uh, sort of anecdotal way. Uh, first of all, I needed to correct uh, the perception that uh, in the plant economy there was universal coverage. Uh, plant economy, uh, metropolitan population is very small. And only people who have so-called state-owned jobs, meaning people who are in companies, uh, factories, are somewhat covered at a very, very rudimental level. I, I remember I used to run an SOE in Nanjing before I came to the United States. We have our own clinic inside our factory campus. There is untrained nurse that will just be there and most coverage is there and we have to get her approval to have to go to another hospital. So that's really not much of health care at all. Then at the time, rural population, at the time, it's about every 10 Chinese, there are nine peasants were not covered at all. They were covered by barefooted doctor that Mao Zedong sent them. So uh, that's where we started. So I would, I would want to make sure that, uh, share my perspective, plant economy has widened coverage grossly, has, you know, high, you know, increased the level of coverage grossly. But again, we have not been at a universal coverage level. That's what what's left to be worked on. But China has done a lot in the last 20 years to do so. For instance, they moved health coverage off the company's balance sheets, socialized that. So there's social security at you know, central level, provincial level. Now they're widening that with especially this financial crisis stimulus package to include more and more people. We've got a long way to go, but moving to the right direction. Can I go back to the previous question about trust? I fully, fully agree. The, in my mind, the, the failure of Copenhagen is lack of trust. Lack of trust from countries like America and China. If we, if we use the metaphor of marriage, the Copenhagen is supposed to create marriage. However, the American culture, the American president says we need prenuptial agreement, right? We want the inspection, okay? From the Chinese side, it sounds very bad. We're, we're talking marriage. Why are you talking about divorce, right? You're talking about contracts or settlement of divorce. So bad feeling, very bad feeling. So this bad feeling actually is preventing us from reaching right agreements. So I hope countries between the US and China and other countries should enhance their degree, their intensity of trust. Only by doing that can we reach meaningful agreements down the road. I'm totally with you on that. On that note, I think, really, uh, China, the key word is strategic trust between China, U.S., and China and the other parts of the world. And there will be a lot of uh, fr frictions and conflicts, as Jiang 
uh, wisely predicted the next few years as we go through the process of a new global order uh, in which China will play a more important role. Um, um, but the key to that, to solving that, to those, those conflicts uh, is, is probably consultation. China needs to constantly consult other countries to solve problems. And by during this process of consultation and conflicts, we hopefully will move on. Um, so at the end of the session, I would like to wish everybody a very happy uh, Chinese New Year of the Tiger, which is only about a week away. Uh, and hopefully we can all create an even bigger pie uh, in 2010, and we can always uh, compete for a bigger slice of the pie, and that's uh, the way it should be. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation. The world needs more good China sessions. That uh, the reason why we hope all of you and them will contribute. So we would like to welcome your feedback and finally a really warm round of applause for yourselves and for them. Thank you.